if I was left to my own devices, I would quite happily spend two or three weeks reading around other subjects than architecture and enjoying the pleasure of swimming and looking at the stars. That's all I would do. I wouldn't be looking to visit buildings or anything else. It's not, I don't need to do that. It's not, a, it's not part it does, of my it holiday does. agenda. Yeah. But but it does it does maybe speak about this uh, notion that we perceive the architect as a as a kind of all knowing um, individual that maybe has to be has to have all this knowledge. And so I was going to begin with something else, but I think this is a nice way to maybe start by just challenging this notion that uh, this I don't know whether it's a Vitruvian notion where you know an architect needs to know everything from um, cosmology to um, to a sort of music but what what do you think an architect needs to know and where how do we draw those boundaries basically well I think there are two um, there are two separate things that you're alluding to there um, one is the idea of an architect as somebody who um, needs to know many things from many disciplines. And I would have thought that it's something of an advantage to have the kind of um, mental world where you're interested in many disciplines, because if you're an architect, you're making a bit of the world at some level. So why would you not be interested in all of the things that make up the world? And certainly, I'm personally interested in lots of things from lots of different disciplines, and I can think of very few where I wouldn't have an active interest, but that's part of my mental life and part of my inner world. And I see the hinterland or the context that that gives me as being a significant aspect of being an architect. Whether it should be a mandatory aspect of being an architect is another matter. I'm sure there are some absolutely brilliant architects who only care about how buildings are put together and very little else. And I'm sure that they do their job very well. But for me, it's a pleasure and an aspect of my job that you can read almost anything and find something that relates to architecture within it. On the other hand, one of the really interesting things about being an architect, which is maybe underrepresented when it's uh, explained to students, is that as an architect, you're constantly being dropped into other people's worlds. And those worlds are comprehensive worlds that you're asked to understand at some level in order to frame them with a building. Um, and if you're somebody who's got an active curiosity, it's a rather wonderful aspect of your job that you meet people who represent all sorts of different ways of thinking about the world. And you're brought quite deeply into their worlds in order to be able to make a building for them. And it's one of the kind of pleasures of the job. But all of that is about curiosity and a broad sense of the world. Um, the other side of your question that I wanted to refer to is this one, which comes maybe more from a kind of Beaux-Arts training and has become an aspect of the training that almost all of us have had and is currently being actively questioned by a new generation of architects, which is what I would call the, the sort of all-in nature of the architect's vocation, um, that you might be surprised that when I go on holidays that I stop thinking about architecture for a few weeks. It sounds to me like a very healthy thing. <laughs> Um, why, why would I spend all my life thinking about architecture? After all, it's only my job. Um, and it's almost a controversial thing to say that in some circles, because the idea is that if you're going to be an architect, you have to somehow live and breathe architecture every moment of your life, which sounds to me like a slightly cult-like formulation. Why on earth would you have to be so consumed by a subject that you can't remove yourself from it and live in other mental worlds as well? And I think that in architectural education, we're slightly bred into this idea that we should give every hour of the day to studying. We should stay up all night. We should do it all because we love it so much. And if we don't love it that much, that somehow we've fallen short. I think that's a very problematic thing to teach to students. And I think when it's carried forward into architectural practice, it's a very problematic thing. Um, it's problematic for a number of reasons. Can you hear me? Because you've I can. I can hear you, yes. Ah. 
Okay. Um, when it's brought forward into architectural practice, it's very problematic for any number of reasons. One of them is it doesn't make a healthy workplace environment where people are expected to work long hours just to show that they care enough. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's I don't think that's a good work environment. I'd say it's a dysfunctional work environment. Also, architects become increasingly willing to offer their services for free uh, because they feel that what they're doing is so important and so significant and so vocational that they shouldn't merely be driven by the fact that they have to earn salaries or fees to do it. That's a very unhealthy formulation as well, in part because it means that you don't respect yourself enough, you don't respect your knowledge enough, and you're willing to offer it to the world without it having a cost because it means so much to you that clearly why, why on earth should it be thought about commercially? But that's a very unfortunate formulation. And what it does is it produces a workplace culture where practices don't charge enough for what they do and they don't pay enough for what they do and they work too long themselves and they expect their staff to work too long. And the whole thing becomes um, a very unsatisfactory way of putting yourself about in the world. And I don't think it... Um, it doesn't begin with respect either for the architects who employ people on that basis who are or who offer their services on that basis mm -hmm. so everything that we're looking at now in modern architectural culture from people doing free internships to people working extremely long hours and i know there are offices where people feel they can't leave at a reasonable hour because they're seen to be you know not trying hard enough or not really feeling it enough or not wanting it enough that's that's a very that's a very unfortunate way of thinking about work. But, so for but, me, I'm very happy to be on holidays. I'm very happy to be on holidays for three weeks, swimming and spending time with my family and spending no time at all thinking about architecture. But, but I think Neil, the, the the question now is: is this is this a realization that took you a while to come to, or is this, um, you know, you sound you sound very reflective of a culture, and I just yeah. wonder whether this this is something um, that took you time to sort of understand and how did you? I think there are a couple of things. When I was a student, um, I was known for working staggeringly long hours. Um, and uh, I probably carried that through to a significant extent into my architectural working life. And the first practice I worked for, I was working you know, sometimes up to 18, 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week for a while. And I thought that by working like that, I was somehow expressing the depth of my attachment to the subject. But I wasn't really, I was just spoiling my youth and my health. I wasn't, um, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing anything that important. By, by, but, but, but we are educated into, are inculcated into an idea of what architecture is, that is almost, as I say, cult-like. And I don't think it's good for um, us. And I actually don't think it's good for architecture or the public idea of what architecture is, because why would the business of making buildings be so extreme? Buildings aren't extreme things. Buildings are ordinary bits of the world. And why can't they be, why can't they be worked on like doctors or lawyers or um, anybody else. What, why can't we? Uh, and I think that what happens is that we think that we're respecting our disciplines. So I'm repeating myself slightly. We think that we're respecting our discipline so much by doing it. But I think that in, it's almost the opposite, that we communicate that our discipline isn't worthy of respect by doing that. Um, and so through my working life, um, Actually, I would say it was mostly my employees and my students who taught me that I was going about it the wrong way. And it was a lesson they were very happy to teach me because they weren't going to come along with me in that process. And I do remember one very famous incident about 20 years ago when one of my senior team, we had a letter from um, a number of Japanese students who said that they had been funded by the Japanese government to come and do free internships in my office. And would we accept them? And I asked my staff what they thought of that because we'd already agreed we wouldn't take students on free internships. No. Um, and I said, well, these guys are being paid by the Japanese government. And one of my employees said, well, the problem with that is that 
they may be being paid by the Japanese government to do it, but they're free to you. And if they're free to you, that devalues our labor in relation to theirs. It makes us all devalued in relation to that. And I thought it was a really good point. And we said, right, well, we won't do that. And certainly in my office, although people do from time to time work long hours, usually we would question them about that and say, why haven't you taken that holiday? Why, why are you working long hours? In other words, what's gone wrong that you end up working long hours rather than, oh, isn't it a great thing that you're putting so much work into it? Um, and to me, that's a transformation that I suspect if I'm being realistic with myself, is that I've learned from teaching and employing people mm -hmm. that there's a younger generation of architects who feel that the respect that they get is through the proper use of their mm -hmm. labor, and they want me to understand that. And I think now I do. And it's good for me too. Yeah. Have you have you at any point in your career? It's it's what you're saying. It's making me think of um, maybe a moment when I felt like I lost maybe fate in the profession and actually like left practice and started exploring certain different things. Um, have you ever had that moment where you where you maybe lost fate in a profession and and felt like you really have to rethink? Um, what you do and how you do it. Um, I don't think from the moment I set foot into first year until now, I don't think I've ever lost faith in the importance of architecture or the, the beauty and pleasure and joy of architecture. Um, but I don't have much faith in the way that it's set up um as a professional discipline in the world i think that somehow architects um well i it's too easy to say that architects have got it wrong because i think it's an interaction between architecture and society that has somehow gone wrong that means that um it is for many people not a very enjoyable thing to be an architect because of things that are surrounding architecture that don't make for a good working life. Mm -hmm. And I'm acutely aware with my own staff of trying to make it something that should in its normal manifestation be pleasurable. But, but the pressures that we're all under are extreme. And I think that there's too much of the business or profession of architecture separate from the vocation of architecture that is not healthy. It's not good for our sense of well being. Mm -hmm. It's not good for, it's a very precarious thing. And I think that, that there would need to be a wholesale root and branch reevaluation of how architecture relates to society and how architects choose to represent themselves in relation to that for it to be the profession that it could be. <clears throat> so I have to a significant extent lost faith in that. And <clears throat> at the core of it, it's too stressful. It should is be it, stressful. Is there, is, um, I wonder whether it's it may be to do with the expectations of those entering the profession. Are we maybe faced with uh, an idea of an architect that isn't realistic? Um, well, I think that there are a number of issues um, that are that are in some ways unhelpful, which is that architectural education is. Um, is treated as a humanist discipline and it's principally taught to students by people who are not practicing architects increasingly so um, and i think that's uh unfortunate because i'm not sure to what extent it's fully preparing students for being architects i don't i don't mean in the kind of casual ways that's usually described but it sets up um, um, a conflict between 
the idea that the architect somehow embodies a set of values on behalf of the world or on behalf of the public that they have to carry through a corrupted and um, a negative construction industry on behalf of other people <laughs> and that their values which they've had inculcated into them through their education are naturally humanist values of the highest order of great sophistication and that these need to be embodied in buildings on behalf of a grateful public um, and I, I just I, I just think that's a very difficult formulation and um, there's another side of it was put to me very brutally at a site meeting by the director of a major UK contractor where he said, he said the problem with architects is they're all values and no skills. And I thought that was a very damning thing to say. I mean, from his perspective, he didn't like being lectured on what a building should be by um, people who then didn't know enough about how to put a building together for them to be really taking a place at that meeting. That was what he was saying to me. Um, but someone else put it in a much more interesting way where they said, we should learn values through the acquisition of skills, mm. which I think is a really interesting formulation mm. because values are not there's there's some sense that there's a there's a perfect set of humanist values about 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 a kind of generous and um capacious architecture which somehow embodies truth in the world mm. um and that if only we could communicate that to everybody else then they wouldn't mind the fact that we don't know how to put things together but i just think that's a very problematic formulation <clears throat> um i was very lucky in my education that i was taught by people for whom um, the detailing and construction of a building was a profoundly philosophical and I would even say ethical thing. And that the authority of the architect was somehow communicated through their ability to instruct people on how to build um, well. Um, and I suppose a lot of my teaching time has been spent around people for whom that wouldn't be obvious at all mm -hmm. and who feel that aspects of critical theory or art theory or art practice or art history or architecture that, 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 that these are things that need to be taught to students preeminently and that they internalize a set of values through that and perhaps they acquire some sense of virtuosity through drawing practices and that that then that virtuosity has to be taken that those ethics and that virtuosity has to be taken out into the problematic world of practice to see whether it can survive against all of the things that destroy worth it's a very negative formulation mm. there, there is something um the, the aspects of architecture as creative field, uh, fields of practicing or valuing innovation or authenticity. I mean, I feel like those questions, the like questions of authenticity, of creativity, though they form as an important part of architectural education, they do seem to be in the current, uh, I'd say, cultural climate, they seem to be sort of criticized. Well, I think there are two different things that I'd like, in the context of architecture, there are two things that maybe I'd like to make a difference. Creativity, in the context of how buildings are made, um, I could think about in a certain way. But virtuosity is something else. Mm. And I think that a culture that <laughs> pays too much reverence to virtuosity is in fact quite a conservative culture because virtuosity is quite a conservative thing. And real creativity is something different. And I often quote to my students that um, I heard somebody describing the great uh, pianist Alfred Brendel and they said that his real greatness was that he had no virtuosity of a conscious kind. 
thought that was really beautiful because that's it's almost where you allow virtuosity to die away that's the moment where you can become truly creative because mm -hmm. virtuosity is a kind of a replication of a preconceived image of ability and it, mm -hmm. it and as such it's conservative mm -hmm. and i think many of the schools that have the reputation for being the most creative schools in the world are often just pandering to a certain kind of virtuosity there's an incredible homogeneity in their output if they were really creative they wouldn't be homogenous they would you would see difference emerging with difficulty out of, out of brightness uh, if you see the fact that anybody can go to the school and come out and play a million trills with ease, mm -hmm. you're probably not looking at the at the, at the rock face of, of innovation. Are you? You're looking at something else. And if everybody is playing virtuosity in the same mode, it's probably not what, what it thinks it is. And I'm impressed by people who go back into the deeper practices of architecture, either through social engagement with communities or through engagement with material practice um, and emerge out of that with forms of innovation, which have a sort of sustainable and deep character. I think that's something else altogether. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So to go back to the question you were asking, I think that many students come out of their education with a strong sense of virtuosity um a strong sense of values and ethics that they've internalized through their education but i think there's a question when that's removed from forms of material practice or from um or from or from or from, or from, or, or from skills which get a purchase in society either through engagement or through technical excellence um, and I like that idea. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I like that idea, which I'll repeat again, which is that values are acquired through the acquisition of skills. And that, that impresses me as an idea. Mm -hmm. There is another element of architectural architecture as a, maybe let's call it creative profession, expression, however we want to call it. And that is the speed at which it manifests in the world. So. So I think that one, one thing for a young person coming out of architectural education, something that we are really not taught and perhaps shown in, in the architectural education is uh, that this is going to take time. And I just wonder, and, and, I, and I almost felt that going into practice was, the real challenge of going into practice was understanding time in its uh, length <laughs> as, as a really important thing that you need to transcend as, as an architect. Okay, so I, th I think there's a, I mean, there's a number of potential strands to the question that you're asking. Um, one of them is how architects spend time when they're designing and the idea of taking time when you're designing. So that's one idea. Yeah. The other is perhaps, um, the fact that um, buildings take a long time to get built and that the length of the process in which you might be engaged in the construction of a building is very long. Um, to me, one of my primary interests is perhaps a third thing, which is that I think at heart, architecture is fundamentally a representation of time, which is maybe a deeper question we could come back to. Um, you talk. You talked about transcending time, but um, I, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. And maybe you could explain it a bit further. Well, well, I guess what I meant is to accept and to indulge in time uh, that it takes to produce uh, a piece of architecture. In comparison to other creative fields where products can often be uh, can often emerge within days okay mm. um <clears throat> i think it's something I, I might come back to later is just the idea that you know architecture has almost always been an enormous investment for whoever 
creates it for whatever community or organization or individual creates a piece of architecture they're investing an enormous amount of social capital into into making a building and that's not nothing nor is it merely the fact that things are hard to do and it takes time but eventually the building itself must be a representation of that social capital mm -hmm. uh, it has to it has to there's so much of it that it can't not be a very important component of the thing itself. Um, so I think that there are issues about, I mean, there's, there's a kind of a quick answer you could give to the fact that it seems as though it might be possible to somehow speed up the process of making architecture, but it's a difficult thing to do and, and why would you want to do it? Um, I think there's a deeper question that's asked. There's a great book I read, guy called um, Trachtenberg who wrote a book called Building in Time, which I'm very interested in, mm -hmm. where he talks about the, the kind of, <clears throat> in particular, he talks about something he calls the Albertian turn, where before that, his concept of building, certainly in the Middle Ages and late Middle Ages, is that um, the, the bands of masons who are making buildings, um, like the great Gothic cathedrals, for example, are involved in an activity where they're both designing and making in time. And the emerging building site or construction site is the site of both design, and manufacture, and a kind of what must be an ongoing reconceptualization of what the project is as it emerges as as a as a as, a, um, as an artifact, and so there isn't such a clear separation between a period of design and a period of making that allows you to conceptualize design as anything but happening in time, mm -hmm. and so design construction inhabitation begin to overlap with each other mm. and you could imagine a perfect conception of a medieval cathedral which is being used built and designed all at once mm -hmm. and that's a kind of a, that's an idea of the world and he sets against that this notion of the albertian turn which is the idea that the identity of the core architectural identity of a building is held in a drawing mm -hmm. which which even if the drawing takes time to make that time can be conceived of as being a moment when mm -hmm. the co when the concept or the architectural identity of the building is realized in a drawing mm -hmm. and everything after that is risk mm -hmm. it, it's it's a potential erosion of the perfect identity of the building but, but but what a thing to think that something which is made through material practice is eventually then put at risk by that material practice, that mm -hmm. the act of building is a risk to the conceptual purity of the architecture. Mm -hmm. And I, that's a fantastic observation, isn't it? And he sees modernism as such as being very much a manifestation. He calls it chronocide. I'm not sure I like that word, but you can mm -hmm. see what he means, that the kind of killing of time. Mm -hmm in the act of design mm -hmm. and, and and the 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 removal of design from the time of building or from mm -hmm. the time of inhabitation mm -hmm. um so that's a very interesting conception of how time could how we could reconceptualize mm. time at being at large in the project and how that might happen but of course certainly in the world of practice that i'm involved in i mean if it was if if alberti saw that as a kind of art historical or conceptual idea of design i mean design is related to drawing in his sense that the design is held in the drawing mm -hmm. the professionalization of architectural practice and the way that it's submitted to modern contract law has pressed that even further so that when you go into contract with a builder you have to have specified every aspect of the identity of the building down to the last nth, and that in part the contractor's job is to challenge your ability to have done that so that they can get commercial reward mm -hmm. from having challenged your ability to completely describe the building in all of its in all of its manifestations in a set of documents and drawings i mean what a weird thing what a weird way yeah. to create the world and yet that's what we do yeah and then the and then the and then the act of 
construction becomes almost a kind of an attack on that set of documents. The contractor is looking for ways. It's not merely that the contractor is observing ways in which the documents don't quite work, <laughs> which they which they almost never could, and then helping you to get over those. That's a nice story to tell. The contractor is paying people to find gaps in your documents, which they can exploit commercially, and which you could be eventually held accountable for. I mean, it's an extraordinarily negative formulation of the world. Um, and so how do you repair that? How, 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 do you, how do you put that Humpty Dumpty back together again? Because um, I don't think it should be possible to create, conceive of a really good building without somehow knowing the act of constructing it. Mm -hmm. um, and those teams of medieval masons who were both making and designing, and often the, the, that brilliant book called The Contractors of Chartres that looks at the fact that teams of masons would come in and find a cathedral that had been already partly built by other teams of masons, and they would pick up the threads and keep going. Uh, and the extent to which they're fully conceptualizing or mm -hmm. conceptualizing through performance is really interesting for me. Is there, is there a building that um, you can think of that uh, captures that? I mean, you did remind me now of a spectacular minster in Ulm in southwest Germany. Built, I think, they started it in, I think, 13-something, and then they finished it in 18-something. It probably took around 500, 600 years to build. But I wonder whether there is a building that... Um, that um, you can think of that captures time in um, in a way that can yeah I'm going to I'm going to take you I'm going to take you um, maybe even further back because I'm quite interested in the way that architecture changes and develops in the um, transition from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic mm -hmm. and um, my argument from looking at those buildings is that. Before that, buildings as we understand them didn't exist in the sense that we now understand them. And so a certain kind of building emerged during that time, which was fundamentally different to anything that I know that went before. And um, the archaeologists who are looking at it, there's a great guy, great guy called Ian Hodder who writes about some of these things. And he calls the first houses that he sees built, he calls them history houses. And he says the primary function of these buildings was not a purpose in the sense that we would think of as a function or even shelter as we might think of as a function. But the primary, represent, the primary function of these buildings was to represent what he calls temporal depth. In other words, a longer extension of time. And the reason that people might have wanted to have done that is because they, they needed to hold communities together for longer periods of time. So there were activities they were involved in that we might call delayed return activities. So where a community are asked to invest in something at a point in time, and then the actual benefit from that doesn't occur until a considerable time later. Mm -hmm. And in order to hold communities together over longer periods of time, they had to invest in a conception of themselves existing as a community over a longer duration that makes it possible to make that investment and that one of the first purposes of architecture as we now understand it was to represent that longer duration and that people would invest into the representation of that longer duration so that it dealt with the kind of cognitive problems of socialization in larger groups for longer periods of time and i find that fascinating because there's two things come out of it one of them is that buildings in their essence represent time, they represent deep time, and they hold us together in our alliances and our allegiances and our promises to each other as communities in longer periods of time. And the other is that the performative aspect of building, which is the act of construction itself, is a binding activity. That, that, that if we need to invest that much into making a building, <laughs> then the mutual investment that we create in making a building gives us a debt of obligation to each other, which hold us together as communities in time. And you asked about the building that best represents the performative aspect of this. And the one that I love is the um, Ring of Brodgar up in Orkney, the great stone circle. 
And the archaeologists who looked at it went to visit all the quarries where the stones were quarried from the stone circle. And they saw that they came from different parts of the archipelago. And so it seemed that different communities were quarrying and dragging huge stones across the landscape to erect them in a circle over a hugely extended period of time. But then he looked at the foundations and said that given that he knows that Neolithic builders could build very really good foundations, that most of the foundations for these stones didn't seem to be permanent. And so he was saying that actually there wasn't a finished conception of a stone circle that they were all trying to make, but they were involved in an ongoing performance. And the stone circle that we see is like a take from that performance. Mm. It's like we've frozen the performance there or it stopped there. So now you can see what it was like. But then actually over maybe hundreds or even thousands of years, people were investing huge amounts of social capital in drawing stones to this place and erecting them together with stones which had been drawn from other communities to represent an idea both of time but also of human investment. Um, and that, that, the, that, that, that given the, the resources required to do that, from rope making to feasting to dragging to everything else, it must have been something extraordinarily important to those people that they were trying to represent. But it didn't appear to be a finished artifact that you could say, now we've spent 100 years doing that or 500 years doing that and we've done it. Rather like your cathedral in Ulm, it appeared to be an architect, that, an artifact that was emerging out of its own performance all the time, which is much more interesting. Isn't it? Is this something that comes into your meetings with your clients? Sometimes. Um, I want to make one last point to that before yeah. I go off that subject. The, the archaeologist came with a lovely formulation where he said that in the Neolithic, construction began to replace the idea of blood. So mm -hmm. that kinship groups were held together by blood, by, by, by kinship. But when they got bigger, you needed something else. And so construction began to replace blood as a thing that held people together. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking to the clients that I have, I mean, you have very different clients. But the sense I always get is that a community of people have come together and you know, to borrow a conception from Lefebvre, the space is already made in a way. By the mm -hmm. time you arrive, the, 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 the social practice that creates the kind of space that, 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 that the building needs to serve already exists by the fact that the community have brought themselves together, that they have created needs as a community that need to be met by your building. So this, the mm. space is something that is that is already imminent. And the task of the architecture is to find a way of, I often use the word framing, and I'm not sure if it's the right word, but I, I, like, I like to get away from the notion of architecture as being primarily generative in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's something about the idea that what is generative is what the communities do to create the space that architecture is needing to serve or to represent. Mm -hmm. That architecture's job has, 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 to find, has to find a way of interacting with that. So I, I use the phrase framing. And to a huge extent, my dialogue with clients when I meet them is not about, you tell me everything that you want and I'll make a building that serves your needs. It's more trying to say that there is something that you're already doing that mm -hmm. requ re requires requires to be represented as architectural. And that representation of architecture, the idea of doing it and representing it and building it and inhabiting it and changing it over time have to be conceived of as one thing. And so a lot of the dialogue I would have with clients is about that. I mean, you always have to set that against the, the actual practicalities of making a building in the, in the current construction climate where everything somehow has to be fixed. But you have to remind people all the time that what you're, I mean, and it's, it's easier in a way in a lot of the environments that I work in, which are historic environments where these communities may have stayed in place for a long time, that um, it's e much easier for them to see what you're doing is an act of continuity. Mm -hmm. 
um, and that you're in a sense picking up stitches from people mm -hmm. who've already created part of the garment mm -hmm. and you're stitching it forward and leaving your stitches mm -hmm. trailing for someone else to mm -hmm. stitch forward and that your building must be complete in itself for its needs in the moment but that you're open to the possibility of the building being expandable mm -hmm. beyond that mm -hmm. that's something that so it's to try and get a, in a sense in order to build buildings today they need to be described in a finite way because that's the world that we live yeah. in but they have to be conceived in terms of your conversation with the client as things that, that go that go beyond that in the moment finite description mm -hmm. or else what are they mm -hmm. so because it's quite obvious a conversation it's quite obvious to see how an archaeological site is a section in time of time and then, but then obviously the question is, is that how you see your work as well? And how does then, how do you then design work which has that ambiguity uh, built into it or does it? But I mean, the point you make about an archeological slide, I mean, it's clear that it's a cut and you can see, you can see, you can see time, you can see time represented in that way. But... Mm. The thing that we so entirely internalize that we don't really see it anymore, uh, and we use other words to describe it, but also to conceal it, is that if you look at a building, it's always a representation of a performance. So we talk about truth to construction, but truth to construction is that if you look at a building, you mentally construct it in your mind and you make decisions about how well that building has represented the performance of its own construction back to you. And that level of legibility can exist in quite a sophisticated way for many architects who are interested in tectonics. They, they would maybe primarily value an ability to almost unpick the performance of its making as being a kind of transparency in the representation of the, of the material <clears throat> practice of the building. But actually, most people quite unselfconsciously, or sorry, quite unconsciously will do the same thing. They'll mm -hmm. trust and feel a building's substance by being able to, at some level, mentally unpick uh, how it was built. Mm -hmm. They also mentally unpick how it's inhabited all the time. They, they read its success as an ability. It's almost like a kind of counterpart to inhabitation. If, if, if the natural inhabitation of the building is this, then the building must be the other term in that dialogue um, and so although the building pre presents itself as a finite static artifact in fact it's probably more like a dancing partner to the inhabitant all the time and the inhabitant is always querying how successfully it's doing that so these are all performances mm -hmm. the, the weathering of a building and its ruination and change over time is also a performance it's an act that occurs where change occurs in time and a really good designer will design that act over time so that somehow the architecture becomes more like itself through the way in which it weathers. Mm -hmm. Different things weather in different ways and the architecture emerges out of that weathering. So that is also another performance. And so what I'm trying to do is to work away from the idea of the building as being a finite architect artifact with a primarily visual singular property which is the sensation of its visual presence and to talk about it more as being a layered together sequence of performances which are all represented um, it makes it easier for me to think about how we would represent ideas in architecture as we build it um, you you do talk about building being reflective of its user community and its sort of moment in history perhaps but what about its environment in an almost phenomenological sense? And one detail of one of your projects that I'm thinking of when I ask you this question is that window that sort of goes into the landscape in the Bishop Edward King's chapel of a detail or a gesture that I feel is a lot more responsive to the, well, it's in a way, reflective of its environment. So, um, there's a kind of primary environment on that site, which is that 
it's, it's a small clearing surrounded by trees. And so at the, the, the primary way in which light is brought into that building is through the clear story lighting at the top. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, we spoke about the light coming through the tree canopy, through the clear story, and then filling the interior with a certain kind of light. And when I was thinking about the project, there was something about that almost absolute interiority when you were in there that I felt was, um, I felt that it kind of, I felt that it needed grounding in some way, in some sense of the outer world. But in that sense, there were a whole number of things I was thinking about. The first one was probably that moment in Le Corbusier's letterette when the chapel actually touches the ground only once. Um, and it's like a kind of an earthing, it's like a lightning rod that goes down into the ground that takes it because the chapel isn't just a kind of suspended vessel. Um, it's grounding, it's grounding, it's actual grounding in the earth is quite important to its theological conception as well. Mm -hmm. So it was that sense of it. Um, and there was a dramatic sense I had. There's a great moment in Macbeth when there's a knocking on the door, when there's an intense interior scene and there's a knocking on the door, and there's a great essay by it that the knocking on the door is, is like another lightning conductor that brings the, the, the interior world in. So I needed this moment in the building to bring some sense of the outer world in. Mm -hmm. So that you have, so that your suspension is made almost more intense by the realization that the suspension is held against something which is not suspended, which is grounded. Um, and the placement of that is opposite just a gap in two of the trees on the side. So you see across the hill to the the valley goes down and rises on the far side, and you see across to that other landscape. So those were things that were very much to do with the sense of what it felt like to be in that space and the sense of immersion in that space. Um, but also, I mean, as an architect, I'm always referring back to other, other architects and other buildings. And that window is counterposed with um, the sister's prayer room, which is a very interior space. And if you look at them in the plan, the form of them relates to two other buildings which are in dialogue with each other. One of them is Rudolf Schwartz's St. Michael's in Frankfurt, which is an elliptical chapel, which is this extraordinary bulbous form coming out of it. And the other is to Peter Zunter's St. Benedict Chapel, in which the doorway has the same plan form. And so they're also referring, um, consciously referring to these other buildings which my building is deliberately in dialogue with. And in Zumter's chapel, the plan form, which is like that, is actually the door in. And mm -hmm. in, mine, it's, in mine, it's the window out. And I had a very specific memory of going to visit that chapel in deep snow. And when I got there, we didn't have the key and someone had to go back and get the key. And I knelt down and looked through the keyhole and saw into the chapel before I went into it. Mm -hmm. And that sense of the light, the view breaking through, and it's amazing because he frames a little box with an icon in it, so mm -hmm. you can you can only see it through the, the keyhole. keyhole. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. And so it was a little um, pointer to that specific memory as well. So in the kind of complicated world of architects, dropping clues to the connections they want to make with other buildings. That's, it's partly that too. So you talk about environment in the question, but the environment is the immediate environment of the site, but it's also a broader context of how that building sits within a history of other buildings that it's in dialogue with. Mm -hmm. and, and am I right to assume that there is a new, a new library at the Maudlins College, that there is a conversation with Louis Kahn? Uh, yeah. Um, um, but, but the conversation, yeah, the conversation with can is maybe direct and obvious. And um, uh, I was taught by Shane de Blockham, who who was a project architect with Louis Kahn and who worked on the uh, Paul Mellon Center in in Yale. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a specific, I mean, the, the library 
specifically refers not just to Kahn, but to Kahn's interest in early work by Frank Lloyd Wright as well. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a great essay by Kenneth Frampton where he writes about Frank Lloyd Wright's influence on Kahn. And he talks about the Larkin building from maybe 2010, or sorry, 1910, 1912, um, and um, Wright's interest in the way that these brick um, towers um, bring air up and weight down. And so he, he, he Frampton makes this lovely connection between Kahn and Wright in relation to the sort of circulation of physical forces that these brick towers are, are allowing the buoyant air to rise up through the building. They're allowing the weight of the structure to come down mm -hmm. and they're opening up to bring light down. So it's like a pulley system. And I thought this image of Frampton's, which relates to both Kahn and Wright, was so beautiful that I wanted to make a building out, out of that, that few paragraphs. So that's what that that's what that project is. Uh, is it, that's that's the the that's the the genesis of that project. But once again, I like this idea of a kind of an ongoing conversation, an ongoing continuity. That I'm looking at Can, who's looking at Wright. Is, is it, that, that there's a kind of a the idea of the accumulation of an idea through a series of iterations over time. But these these buildings. Um, I don't want to put myself in elevated company, but these buildings at whatever level of performance or achievement are related to each other through a chain of thinking that's, that's connected over time. I think another another playful element that um, that I discovered in that building in, in the, uh, I just want to call it correctly, New Library at Modlands College, is the playfulness in the grid, in the structural grid of the building. Where the grid, the line that we, the lines that we often draw, are now wider. Whether they're wider or whether they're they're more, the grid lines are more frequent. I was just curious about how you thought. Um, they are actually very regular. I have to tell you, um, they um... regular, but framing the corridor section. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's a very Kahnian notion. It's a, it's what we call a tartan grid. So in each dimension, you get an A, B, A, B, A, B rhythm, and then you cut it across with an A, B, A, B, A, B rhythm. So you go small, large, small, large, small, large, small, large, small. And so you get this quite rigid grid. Um, Kahn used it. Um, Hertzberger used it. You see it a little bit really interestingly in John Soane's house in um, Lincoln's Inn. Um, and these were the three key references that we had for that project. Um, and one of the things I was aware of is that when you set up the grid, it can be, even the tartan grid can be quite relentless. So what we did was we cut across the very regular plan grid with this rotation and section. So the voids in the building from the ground floor, you have a single void, which is one square bay by three stories high. And then on the first floor, you have a void, which is two square bays by two stories high. And on the top floor, you have a void, which is three square bays by one story high. So you go one, three, two, two, three, one. Um, and that creates a kind of tumbling over mm -hmm. or a rotation in space, which is played against the mat-like quality of the grid. And so there's a slightly labyrinthine quality to the building when you go into it, that you're wandering in a labyrinth, but it's actually created by a very static grid, which is tugging against this more complex rotation and section. So that's that thinking was really at the very beginning of the project, that sort of one, three, two, two, three, one, played against the ABABAB of the tartan grid. Um, and that's what gives you, to some extent, the complexity or the playfulness of the section. And then in a way, everything that is subservient, I mean, it's what Kahn calls served and servant spaces. It's a kind of Bozar conception that you have this idea that everything which is subservient, which is staircases, passageways, bookshelves, and built-in desks are all in the narrow bit of the grid. And then the rooms, which are more for being than for doing, are in the wider sections of the grid. And so you get this play between kind of rooms and passageways that, that comes naturally out of the grid. Mm -hmm. So these are conceptions that go from, from the Beaux-Arts up into um, Khan and, 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 and on, on into this building. And is there an element in, in, in that building that uh, could 
could be compared to the to the window in the chapel yeah the thing that um um that does the same I mean, that's, that's the same trick well, the, well, there's two things, I suppose. There, there, there's, in terms of the kind of TikTok, tech, the kind of fundamental underlying construction or conception of the building, there's a place where all these grids meet, um, which we in the office were calling the hashtag because all the themes, it's like warp and weft, it's the place where all the threads come together and you see the brick towers rising up, the way they're connected by precast lintels and the way these timber beams then pass through them at different levels. And so you pass under these, every time you go under a node point in the, in the grid, you see all these, all the whole warp and weft of the building comes together, which is conceptually very satisfying. But the thing that, I was fascinated with within that kind of objective underlying order. The thing I was fascinated by was the variety of psychological experiences that the readers would have. So you have at the largest, these very long kind of almost monastic refectory tables where lots of people can sit around the same table and read in a big high space. Mm -hmm. And then you go down to smaller rooms where there are single tables where a seminar group might sit around. And then you get these individual desks which look out over the double height spaces or triple height spaces of the library. And finally, you get these tiny little desks which are built into the walls, which are very, very private and very cave like. And really, what I was trying to do within the conception, within the kind of regulating conception of the overarching order which I've described, I wanted to have these moments where the psychology of each individual reader is given room to grow. Some of us like to sit in a corner with our back to the world and disappear. Some of us like to sit around a table and be with folk and then go off into our world. Some of us like to be in a high point looking down over other things. So whether you're perched or grounded or concealed, they're all different psychologies for different readers. But the point about it is that the library becomes a place where the person can then situate themselves and then take flight. They can move off into, into the space of the book. That's that's what that's for. So those are the two equivalents I would give you. I'm fascinated by the, um, the interiority of, uh, I don't want to say your building, but even not just this conversation. How do you, how do you approach elevation? Uh, you mean uh, designing the elevation of the building? Um, I mean, we do obsess over it a bit in the office. I don't know if that's if, if that is something that surprises you or not. There's usually a core conception. Um, for example, if you think about the library we've just spoken about, you have this stereotomic brickwork which is rising up from the ground and is made from thick piled up pieces of you know red red bits of solid matter and that's that's a kind of that's a kind of build up of piling one thing on the other and then you have these lightweight tectonic timber framed projecting elements which are the windows which are kind of nested into it mm -hmm. so you make this kind of grounded masonry cradle and then you sit these nested elements into it and then to some extent, the play of the elevation is the interpenetration up of the solid bits and down of the framey bits. And they begin to they begin to do this with each other. So that you know the, the, the highest solid bit is the chimney rising right up to take the air out of the top. And the lowest timber bit comes almost down to the ground. So you have this the, the sort of um but 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 the, the the high thing is consciously framed and made of bits of air and geometry. And the low thing is consciously sculpted and made of mass and made of solidity. And so there's a kind of the earth rising up and the kind of framey thing descending down and they, 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 they interconnect at different places. The other thing about elevations that I tend to spend a lot of time on is that you look at the elevation as a completely flat projection. But I'm always interested in taking that flat projection and turning it and looking at it on the oblique, because that's the way we experience them most of the time. And there's usually a very conscious play in the elevations that we design between the narrowness of the leading edge and the thickness of the depth of the wall. Mm -hmm. So you see the front of the elevation is being made of very fine lines. If you look at it in a purely linear way, and it's quite 
transparent, let's say. But as soon as you turn it obliquely, it becomes much more opaque. And so you get this interplay. So I'm fascinated by exploring that thing about the depth of the wall in the elevation and the way when you rotate it, that you get very different experiences of it. And if you work in my office, the time we spend trying to get the leading edge as thin as possible, it's always usually about the, the thickness of your fingertip or one brick or something, these very thin leading edges. Mm -hmm. And then they tend to thicken back into the construction. Mm -hmm. So you get this very tight line drawing on the very outer edge of the building, which creates a kind of tension. Mm -hmm. But then you get this carving back, which creates the sense of solidity and mass. So that's the play that I'm usually looking for. In but, any but, elevation. but what what does uh, presumably that this this uh, differs with with each project? But is elevation there to capture some of the essence of the project? Is it there to enclose um, an idea, or is it the idea itself? In a way, I haven't found a definitive clue. I think your pro your recent project in uh, Oxford, the um, the student hall, as you sort of end across Modlands Bridge and go right, going into Oxford, and then it's on the left hand side. That's very elevational. Yeah, but I mean, what I've just been talking, mean, what I've just been talking about there, technically, it was extremely demanding to get these deep fins to be. Mm -hmm just one break yeah. and then and then they they, they 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 step back in to give this great sense of solidity and mass so what i was interested in is the student in their room who's got two big glass windows so in a sense they're quite exposed but i want them to feel that they're also contained so i'm playing a game of openness and depth mm -hmm. that you can sort of sit perched in your window without feeling that you're being pushed out onto the edge of a street in a glass mm -hmm. box and so on the inside, I'm building it out with joinery, and on the outside, I'm building it out with masonry. So the, the, the meniscus of the glass is framed both inside and out by these solid elements that sort of hold you and frame you and let you feel that you're that there's a depth within which you're contained and protected. And mm -hmm. so that, that's the psychology of it. In terms of the organization, you'll see a lot of our facades are organized quite mathematically in, in these very quite almost grid-like ways and i'm interested in that as a kind of an underlying kind of mu music or patterning to the elevation which gives a, a sense of being deeply ordered mm. um, and usually what you're looking at in multiple i mean it's very different from other ones we talked about but in multiple accommodation like a student accommodation you're looking at the representation of the room you're looking at the representation of the window the other elements within it the way that they interplay you know and syncopate with each other across the facade but that's a patterning in two dimensions <clears throat> but the thing that we're probably more preoccupied by once again is that rotation where that patterning reveals itself in the depth of the wall so the hierarchy of room is pushed further state given given the, the dominant beat mm -hmm. and then the hierarchy of window and so on is pushed next back and given the subdominant beat and then other things which we've got to do with ventilation and so on so you get this kind of layering back into the facade so that you get a kind of a legibility to the hierarchy of the elements that are operating within the architecture i mean i think that's what we're trying to do mm -hmm. is there is there an element of surprise that you're interested in i i'm personally fascinated by pantheon in rome that uh, had that um element that the, the the sort of circularity of its interior had an element of surprise and that was something that Hadrian the emperor who uh, built the latest uh, pantheon that we see today uh, was captivated by the notion of approaching a building that may seem square but then as we sort of enter it we we are surprised and there's something interesting in what you're saying about facades being almost a cinematic device which as you as we perhaps move around it are presented with a discovery i mean what you're talking about is a kind of um i mean there is a kind of a there is a kind of a drama or there is um i mean it, once it goes back to this thing about the experience of architecture being primarily performative mm -hmm. um <clears throat> because if we take hadrian's building um 
if you went in and it was a complete surprise, like an absolute and total surprise, it it might not work. Mm -hmm. But 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 it's enough of a surprise for you and you to go in to go ah. It's, it's a bit like when you're watching a good film or reading a good novel or watching a TV program where when the denouement comes, mm -hmm. you go, oh, you're both surprised, but another part of you goes, oh, well, in a sense, I should have known because all those clues mm -hmm. were given to me beforehand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So part of drama is laying out the clues in such a way that when you see them, they don't tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. But when that thing happens, you go, ah, of course, da, 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 da. now it all works. You get it in music, you get it in theater, you get it in film. I think, I think architecture is like that as well. So it's both showing and concealing all the time. And it's preparing you for things that are going to happen next without taking the surprise away. But when the surprise occurs, you're going, ah, of course. Yeah. And so to me, that one after the other character of architectural experience is something that you have to design with. I know the one we designed recently in Limerick for the International Rugby Centre. We had this thing of the vault. And mm -hmm. so the vault is expressed on the elevation of the building very clearly. Mm -hmm. But when you go into the... Um, the entrance space, there's a very clear and simple vault up in the ceiling above you. Then as you go through the building, you keep dipping in and out of these completely immersive digital experiences, which we've no control over. But when you come out of it, you're always presented with another space, which is another vault, mm -hmm. which is a variation on the vault that you've seen before. And we felt that all the way through, it's like a good film or like a good book, but you have to keep giving little surprises as you go along to drive the narrative through the building. But that there are just ways of playing with the same vault so that when you get to the top of the building, there's this very complex and elaborate manifestation of the vault, which is both a surprise and something that you could have expected because all the time the clues are being laid as you go along. So there's that sense of the one after the other, that the building isn't a static artifact, that it has a one thing after another quality, that it's performative and that, that your experience of visiting and witnessing the building is also performative. It's not this, the experience is not dissimilar to film as a medium of, of narrative. Is there, is, there, yeah. is there a reference that is with you and that uh, you go back to? I mean, to be honest with you, I use it as a fairly simple metaphor, and mm -hmm. I guess I do watch films, but there are a lot of architects who would lay claim to a deep theoretical connection between their buildings and film. And I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't strain to do that in relation to my own work. I think that music is like that. I think drama is like that. I think theatre is like that. That what I'm saying is, well, I'm rather than thinking about film in particular, I would go back to the question that we began with, or the, the statement that I made that I think that architecture is fundamentally embodiment of time-based processes mm -hmm. and that the paradox of architecture is that in its stillness or in its static character it's always an body of performative uh, of, of, of performances and an, an, an embodiment of the passage of time and of course the passage of time in the building and the experience of the building the remembered journey through the building or in Corbusier's terms the architectural promenade these are these are an aspect of that but they're just one aspect of it mm. Um, I, maybe, maybe my final question, and I think in a weird way we've covered so many things that um, that I've noted down, but not in the way that I noted them down. So, um, the the capturing in in your interest and in your sort of prolific work in the realm of uh, religious buildings. How do you capture the meta? And in a way, you've explained it a little bit, I think, with um, with the story of that uh, window. But but um, I, you know, in a religious building, there is something that is higher than the environment. There is something that is higher than the than the functionality of space. And I just wonder uh, where does that come from? And then how? How does that get distilled um, in, into a gesture, into a, a space, uh, a detail? Um, <clears throat> I think what your, I mean, your word, meta, 
Um, I presume you mean something like the story that explains the other stories, or mm -hmm. the idea that explains the, the the idea that relates to all the all, all the other ideas, the 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 overarching thing to which the other aspects eventually refer. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you mean. Correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. Um, and sometimes I talk about, um, I use another phrase, which is the idea of a what's sometimes called an external correlative, which is, you know, for example, you could have talked about certain kinds of Christian architecture, which eventually always re refer back to the idea of God, so that God is the external correlative for that architecture. It's the thing, it's the, the idea of the Christian God is the thing that gives meaning to every other thing, the purpose of the building, the labor in, involved in the building, the wealth expended on the building, the materials used in the building, the plan of the building, the details of the building, the decoration of the building, the rituals that occur in the building, they all refer back to this idea of the Christian God. Um, and you might say in the Enlightenment, the idea of God began to transfer over to an idea of nature. So nature became, the idea of nature became the external correlative for the kind of Enlightenment project, or even maybe the concept of reason itself. Mm -hmm. um, and these were represented and embodied. And so the, so the, the overarching purpose of the building was seen as being reason or nature or or God. And one of my favorite writers, um, the 19th century writer uh, Gottfried Semper, I thought did something quite interesting in that his four um, principles um, for architecture, four founding principles for architecture, which are um, the earthwork, the tectonic frame, the hearth, and the woven enclosing screen. Which are, which are his primitive hut. So in as much as um, the original primitive hut in its 18th century conception is pointing to you know, nature, the idea that nature is the origin of architecture, Semper changes the primitive hut. And he says that all of these four things are related to the sort of mo most foundational human activities. Um, and but each, each of those human activities is related to a fundamental concept of human society. So he sees human socialization being embodied in material practice. So that weaving is always the separation of the inner world from the outer world. Mm -hmm. you know, so the tectonic frame or carpentry, um, the hearth, which is, which is, which is a, about human communication and socialization, is represented by ceramics and metalwork. So he, he thinks of the things that are, that are central to human socialization, human society, and he finds a, a correlative in human make, making or material practice. And then he says that architecture is the embodiment, is a, is a materialization or embodiment of those social concepts. And... <clears throat> I find that incredibly persuasive because he places what's being representative, it's what's being represented back into the middle of human culture, rather than being the thing which is divine or overarching or mm -hmm. metaphysical or uh, 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 transcendental. He sees it as being profoundly situated within human culture. And I find that really reassuring. And then I think, well, What's the relationship between what's transcendent and the, 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 the material or social practices that humans have created to embody what's transcendent? And to me, that's where the idea of architecture being a material practice, which fundamentally embodies the passage of time, mm -hmm. is the thing that I find most persuasive. And that it is the sense that the frame of the building appears in its stillness to hold the passage of time or to to be the counter term to the passage of time mm -hmm. and yet is in itself a representation through the representation of inhabitation the representation of weathering the representation of construction or ruin um, that all of these representations are representations of performances and it's these material and social performances uh, that hold communities together in time 
and that in order for communities to be held together in time in that way, that the that the the the, the binding material practice is construction, mm -hmm. and the act of construction and the outcome of construction is the thing that represents us in time. So that's that's my meta. If you if you if you want to mm -hmm. want to go back to your original question. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. I do I do have a I do have another thought, but uh, but I think this this maybe captures it. I mean, okay, I'll just I'll just say it. We can cut at any point now, but but that cross that X in um, um, in that um, you might have to remind me that the name of the project. Yeah, it's a, it's the it's the Faith Museum in Bishop Auckland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder what does that uh, thing capture? Okay, um, we were given a particular and difficult problem, which mm -hmm. is that the building is for a faith museum. Mm -hmm. So there's two two terms there. One of them is faith, and the other is museum. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it, uh, one of the problems I've been given a few times. It's enormously difficult, which is to create representations architectural representations of faith without mm -hmm. there being a specific faith or a specific liturgy, mm -hmm. because I think that faith itself is materially and socially embodied. So the idea of it having a floating signifier uh, or an abstract connotation, I find very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I began to think about it in different ways. And one of them is that a museum is a secular institution. Mm -hmm. A museum is a kind of an institution of the enlightenment and it's a highly secular idea mm -hmm. and yet the idea of faith is transcendental and i found that in, an interesting combination and i thought how would you find a way of taking a secular building type and giving it a, a, a connotation of the sacred mm -hmm. um and there was something which i came upon which is i had given it to my students a number of years ago which is two buildings one off the west coast of ireland and one off the um uh, one in Japan and Issei, and there are two buildings where the crossing of the rafters like this on the gable are given sacred connotations. Mm -hmm. And through a very long chain of associations going back to Roman buildings, the building off the west coast of Ireland takes the crossing of the rafters, which must originally have been built in timber, mm -hmm. re recreates it in stone, and then makes it the symbol of Christ. And the building in Japan which has a different idea of time, which is more cyclical, takes the crossing of the rafters and retains it and makes it a symbol of the god Amaterasu, who is the Shinto god. Um, and what I was fascinated by in both instances is the way that they, the sacred symbol emerges out of a, a material practice, a constructional material practice. So I know where the rafters were bound together, and I know the visual effect of the bound rafters was striking. And I know why then people invested symbolically into them. But in two cultures completely disconnected in two different parts of the world, there's something about human culture that turns up the practicalities of material practice into the symbol of the divine. I always look at, look at the water going past and feel that that's everything we've been talking about. There it is. <laughs>